Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, world famous psychic medium and defender of the dark arts, Miss Ellen DeGeneres! <laughs> Dead eyes gaze out from the shadow of his top hat. Part of a modern costume, omnipresent on heads of both the bourgeoisie and the aristocrat. A kind of sartorial recognition of their equality. This inclusion of the top hat, here modeled by rag picker Coyardet who frequented the area near the Louvre and was known as an eccentric alcoholic, is distinctly modern, a symbol of social boundaries being questioned. The subject is influenced by the poem, the rag picker's wine in Baudelaire's Le Fleur du Mal. Like Baudelaire's poem, the painting is a social commentary on modern-day Paris, a study in the pathos and heroism of modern life, and marks an important break from conventional painting for Manet. Many of the academics of the time were appalled by Manet's bold brushwork outlining of forms, interpretations of space and the painting was rejected from the salon. When Couture first saw the finished absinthe drinker, he is reported as having said to Manet, quote, an absinthe drinker? My poor friend, you are the absinthe drinker. It is you who have lost your moral faculty. <laughs> Here, one might see the absinthe drinker as similar to Velasquez's nippus. Manet once claimed that Velasquez was, quote, the greatest artist there has ever been. He gave me enormous hope and courage, end quote. Such reinvention of Velasquez's manipus speaks to what Manet did perhaps best. Manet put emphasis not on his subjects, so much as on his witty and slightly paradistic transformation of them, perhaps intended to point up by contrast the sterile, sterile traditionalism of ordinary salon painting. Manet is thus questioning the conventions of the salon, classical academic painting, and the status of art itself, though perhaps in not so harsh a manner as Cezanne, claiming in a furor of frustration that he would submit a, quote, pot of shit, unquote, to the salon. Now, absence from the grave, having emerged from these increasingly coffee-filled streets of Paris, like the Charlie Chester on his horse, Monsieur Manet changed the direction Western art would take for the next century. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Monsieur Edouard Manet! Oh, just look at that man, eh? So, Monsieur Manet! Excuse me, 
Manny! So you've had quite a few problems getting your works into the salons, hmm? People have said that you are a quote, Gorgon native in the depths of the Mexican pampas, end quote, and your quote, brushwork was so lacking in finesse that it could have been done with a floor mop, end quote. I also have it on record that you are quite a French idiot who certainly must be the greatest and most conceited ass who ever lived, end quote. And that, quote, every year there is a Manet problem, just as there is an Orient problem or an Alsac Lorraine problem, end quote. And finally, no, finally, Monsieur Corbet, as he stepped from your art pavilion, exclaimed only, quote, what Spaniards? Oh dear, and I'm afraid there have been some even more extreme reactions to your works. Is that right? Can they, uh, Becky? Can they pull up the wonderful? So this piece here, the execution of Maximilian, was actually banned from the nation of France. Do you, uh, get to comment on that? So Terrible events. Will we ever recover from them? Everyone blames his neighbor, but the fact is, we're all to blame. Well, an interesting take on the subject, I'm sure. But let's consult the experts. Here's Art Rinadoc! The execution of Maximilian is a social commentary expressed through the means of parody drawn from Spanish art history. Here we see a contemporary scene largely familiar to the general public in France. The scene is, as the title describes, the execution of France's puppet monarch Maximilian ruling in Mexico. The event of the execution of Maximilian was indeed a blow to the public. One newspaper announcing, quote, tragedy is certainly not dead. Shakespeare could not have imagined a more shocking fifth act, end quote. Manet became almost obsessed with the event and produced a number of paintings, each formulated by working from newspaper reports, more reliable reports giving eyewitness testimony. In composing the scene, Manet borrowed directly from Goya's the 3rd of May, 1808, with executioners in a group on canvas right, guns pointed at their victims. Manet purposefully painted the foot soldiers wearing distinctly French uniform, the man on far canvas right holding a Gun is a reference to a soldier required to step in and finish off the emperor as he lay bleeding on the ground. However, Manet gave the executioner a goatee beard that made him uncannily look like Emperor Louis Napoleon. The image with its stark newspaper account sensibility seems detached as a pure sight devoid of emotion on the part of the painter and subject alike. The flattened space with broad, thick areas of baked and high stone wall close the viewer in and place them directly in front of the action as a helpless viewer. Here, we are all to blame for what happened. The execution of Maximilian did not speak well of Napoleon's foreign policy and censorship so typical of the Second Empire's approach to the press threatened to make Manet's gigantic canvas illegal. This modern interpretation of Goya's the 3rd of May 1808 again challenges salon conventions with both painterly technique 
and art history references and parody so common of man, eh? Here again, a conscious affront to tradition and accepted social convention. <laughs> All right, now hold that thought. Looks like we're going to have to take a short break, and when we come back, We'll take you all the way back to the beginning of the 19th century. You won't want to miss it. Stay tuned! Friedrich's Cloister Cemetery in the Snow was destroyed in 1945 during the aerial bombing of Berlin. All that remains today is a black and white photograph, which many have recolored in an attempt to resemble the artist's original palette. Painted between 1817 and 1819, Cloister Cemetery in the Snow was crafted near the end of one of Friedrich's major depressive episodes, one of at least five such depressions believed to have afflicted the artist throughout his deeply tormented life. Although interpretations of this piece are extremely varied among contemporaries and critics, it is certain that this painting and its significance were deeply personal subjects for Friedrich. This motif is one that he explored often in his paintings of barren, commonly winter-ridden landscapes. In fact, this rendition is a reconstruction of his earlier Abbey in the Oakwood, painted between 1809 and 1810. Just four years prior, the artist had attempted a gruesome suicide, likely exacerbating his already despondent temperament. While most sources agree that the two of these images are an existential meditation on Friedrich's own life, death, and burial, there is some debate over the extent to which themes of the afterlife and promise of salvation are also present. Critical interpretations address three potential explanations for Friedrich's blatantly cold and unforgiving confrontation with his own mortality, and it appears as though this open-ended response was precisely the artist's intention. More frequently, however, it is generally accepted that both Cloister Cemetery in the Snow and Abbey in the Oakwood can be categorized as religious landscapes, but interpretations within this category are hardly consistent. Is it a commentary on the decline of the church and religious rituals now rejected and forgotten? Or is it about the omnipresence of nature, despite which men among us may live and die? Less commonly, others assert that Friedrich's paintings express a profound sense of patriotism at a time when his homeland was experiencing severe political instability and the dissolution of German identity. Regardless, though, nearly everyone can agree that at some level, the subject here is death itself.
Utilizing this avenue, a stylistic comparison to his Abbey in the Oakwood provides a telling progression of Friedrich's melancholic depression, as well as his recurring consideration of and apparent longing for death. <laughs> but first, in both images, the tripartite separation of space and axial symmetry lends the composition the character of an altarpiece. This is made even more dramatic in the later painting by bringing the trees that frame the crumbling abbey closer to the foreground and tilting them outward on a slight diagonal axis. In this way, Friedrich has elevated landscape painting to the status of religious subjects, intertwining the two as an expression of his belief that, quote, the divine is everywhere, even in a grain of sand, end quote. In both paintings, an open grave, freshly dug, greets the viewer in the foreground, while just beyond, an eerie procession of monks bears a casket as they retreat into the ruins of a derelict Gothic abbey. Though the open grave is widely recognized as the artist's own, this knowledge does not erase our shaken subconscious. No, we are compelled to escape the haunting darkness of this melancholic dream world, and yet our curiosity consumes us. We must explore it further. No, I don't know about you, but doesn't that just seem downright depressing to think about your own death? Why, it has often occurred to me to ask myself, do I so often choose death, transience, and the grave as subjects for my paintings? One must submit oneself many times to death in order to someday attain life everlasting. And Mr. Fabric, did you ever expect such a controversial response to your art, even moving into the 21st century? I had no intention of working against the dictates of the day. I spit about to my chrysalis and leave it to time to decide what shall become of it, whether a brilliant butterfly or a maggot. So you're a butterfly! If you speaking of poetry, you would quit the bit of your own, in that way. In fact, one of your followers, Christian Grosser, not that quote, his dreamlike impression of an unknown world are deeply and fundamentally poetic, end quote. What at all? What's your take on that? Beware of the superficial knowledge of cold fact, for it kills the heart. So, you admit then there's a strong religious component to our works. How does this relate to the audience? Preserving yourself a pure childlike spirit. And follow closely your inner voice, for that is the divine in us, and it does not lead us astray. S speaking of being led astray, let's turn our attention to what is arguably our most famous painting of our executor. <laughs>
artworks most easily identified by the public, second only to Leonardo's Mona Lisa, it can certainly be said that the scream is also emblematic of an artistic movement that, like Romanticism, first developed in Germany. Both artists have captured an isolated figure, arrested by an emotional response to his perceived environment. The common themes of isolation likely stem from similar psychological instabilities. Monk, like Friedrich, was severely afflicted by constant recurrences of death in his family and social circles. With these images, the verticality of each composition disturbs the horizontal tradition of landscape painting, while simultaneously reinforcing the strength and importance of the prominent figure in the foreground. Interestingly, it is also thought that Monk's skeletal figure is meant to be a self-portrait. Regardless, though, both forms maintain a universal quality that easily transmits to viewers with the purpose of eliciting a similar emotional response to their surroundings. Two distinct features of these paintings, however, directly contrast. First, Monk's primary figure is turned frontally toward the viewer, revealing the deeply emotional nature of this aesthetic reaction to reality and the world around us. And this is the key factor. Both of these paintings document highly personal and acutely expressive, but profoundly opposing experiences of the natural landscape. One inspires awe and existentialism, the other a tormented scream and violent paranoia. <laughs> Wow! Such an intense massage! No! I know you make a bit of a habit of refusing to publicly explain your paintings, but what can you tell us about your experience with public reception of water above the sea of fog? Artworks as mediator between nature and man. The original being too great, too sublime for the masses to be able to grasp it. The image, being a work of man, is closer to a weak being. And this explains the expression that it is so beautiful it can be a painting, instead of saying of a painting that it is so beautiful it can be nature. So, if it's meant to be an experience of nature's beauty, why the eerie tendency towards themes of isolation? I must remain alone and know that I am alone in order to see and feel nature more fully. What's the point of venturing into nature to experience the divine if you must do it alone? <laughs> You call me a misanthrope because I avoid society. You err. I love that. But in order not to... Shit. I love society. But in order not to hate man, I must avoid his company. Why does that sound familiar? Well, it's time to wrap up here as a final thought, Mr. Fabric! If you had the opportunity to confront your critics of today, what would you say to them? Oh, Father, give them what they know not what they do. Well, there you have it, folks. That's all the time we have for today. But make sure to tune in next week. We're hoping to make contact with Frederico and finally get to the bottom of that epic unibrow. It could get hungry. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Evelyn DeGeneres. Sketch. The medium sketch? Yeah, it wasn't rare and it certainly wasn't well done. <laughs> <laughs>